Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to Simply Reacts. So, this series is going to be called Watching Wild High. <laughs> Fuck my life. I just did a joint uh, back there in my, in my balcony. Yeah, yeah. Out of this room because I can't smoke here. And I turned on the camera. Yeah. And we have Mr. Battle in here. Ghost of Light 401. Bro, let's just get straight to it. Mr. Balance seems high as hell. <laughs> but it's only a frame, whatever, bro. I, I got you, yeah, yeah. What's up? <laughs> My wife is a total skeptic. She does not believe Ooh. in the paranormal <laughs> whatsoever and never has. But when I told her just a portion of today's story, specifically the part about the passenger in first class, you'll know when you get to that scene, she told me she was so intrigued by it. And I think the reason for that is in this story, as you'll see, there were so many witnesses, hundreds of witnesses. And so how could they all be making this up? But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once a week. Bro, I swear to God, Mr. Mr. Baron does the most shit, not shittiest, <laughs> most shit, most shittiest for your pants. That's what I meant. He does a very good job of telling stories, bro. I'm a down. international airport in Queens, New York, heard over the intercom that Eastern Airlines Flight 401 to Miami was now boarding. About 30 minutes later, all 176 passengers, which included the 13 crew members, had made it on board, and then... Oh, bro, we're going to have a... Uh, oh, fuck. An airplane flight. Oh, fuck me. Oh, missing airplane. Yeah, that's, uh, that's for me. That's for me. And at that point, the 13 crew members began making their final preparations for takeoff. Flight 401 was a very expensive and recently introduced model of plane by Eastern Airlines called the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar. And it was both unbelievably technologically advanced yeah. and unbelievably enormous. It sat up to 400 passengers, which meant instead of having four seats to a row, like you would expect. Bro, let me do something, guys. <laughs> Right. Inside of a passenger jet, the L-1011s had eight seats per row, and they had two levels. There was the main level. Bro, am I recording? Oh, yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was the main cabin where all the passengers were. <laughs> and then there was a second Shit. level, a lower level, that was only accessible via two small elevators that could barely fit one person inside of them in the back of the aircraft. And down on this lower level was a full-size kitchen, which had ovens and refrigerators. And also at the back of this lower level was a lounge area for flight staff. The pilot that night was Bob right. Loft. Oh my God, look at his face, bro. Come on. He looks like a sa salmon. Bro, the fish. Salmon. Look at this guy, dude. <coughs> <coughs> the same person, I, I don't know. His face is like the face of this fish. Not even gonna capture you. Look. What? He was a fish man. <coughs> he was a fish man. He was a fisherman. He was a fish. He was a f he was a fish in his previous lifetime, bro. I'm telling you, no cop. Who was a strikingly handsome 55-year-old man with over 30,000 hours of flying experience, which nah, for reference is, come on. is a t over. Th 30,000 hours of flying experience, which for reference is a. T over 30,000 hours of flying experience, 30, for reference, is a ton of flying experience. Captain Bob was known as a perfectionist who exuded confidence and who was cool under pressure. 
After Bob had boarded the aircraft, he had made his way right into the cockpit, which is the very front of the plane where the pilots right. fly the plane, and he had sat down in the customary captain's seat, which was the front left seat. And then after he had sat down, his 10 years younger first officer or co-pilot, a man named Bert Stockstill, had joined him in the cockpit and sat down in the customary co-pilot seat, which was directly to the right of Captain Bob. Bro, we know where the seats of the plane are. <laughs> I don't have to explain anything, but this guy looks like, looks like, looks like this dog. Bro, am I, look, identical. What? Humans and dogs actually are. And so after the pilot and co-pilot were both seated, <laughs> the remaining two members of that night's cockpit Whoa. crew came into the cockpit. Now, normally in most passenger jets, there were only two seats in the cockpit, but because L-1011 planes were so massive, yeah. there were four seats in the cockpit. And so one of the last two men who joined the cockpit was 51-year-old Don Repo, who was the flight's engineer. All right. And despite him being this big, <laughs> strong this ox over. of a man, he was actually known as being fairly soft-spoken and very approachable. All and right. so Don came into the cockpit, he said hello, and then he sat down in the seat right behind the co-pilot, Bert. And then a few seconds after Don, the last man came into the cockpit. It was 47-year-old Angelo Donadeo. Angelo was not actually part of that night's flight crew. However, he was an employee of Eastern Airlines and that night he needed to get to Miami. And so the company had put him on flight 401 and sat him in the fourth and final seat in the cockpit right behind Captain Bob. Why do we hear all this? I don't get it. Like what? Come on, bro. You're telling so many details. Bro. Around 9, 10 p.m. I don't all pre-flight checks had been completed. All passengers were seated, as was the crew. And so Captain Bob began taxiing over Captain to the Bob. Road. Ten Captain minutes Bob. later at 9, 20 p.m., Captain Bob pushed the Captain Bob, forward, baby. and the plane began to take off. Fuck A few yeah. minutes later, and Flight 401 Captain was Bob. airborne up in the night sky over New York, headed south towards Miami. For the next two hours, this flight was completely normal. In fact, it was so normal that one of the passengers named Jerry Escow actually wrote a letter while he was on the plane telling Eastern Airlines how great their airline was and how smooth this flight was. His plan was, yeah. once they landed, to mail this letter to Eastern Airlines. But right. at 11.32 p.m. So oh, it was the first flight of the plane, right? New technology and shit, right? Fuck no, bro. I'm not going in there, bro. Even if you pay me, I'm not going to the first ever flight of a plane. Never, bro. Never. Two hours. It can be the most... Look. It can be the most fucking expensive technology, the most fucking new technology, and one fuck up of a code can crash the airplane. I'm not even joking. And 12 but minutes shit. after takeoff... This flight would go from being very routine and normal to being anything but. At 11.32 p.m., Captain Bob began his approach to Miami International Airport, but when he lowered the plane's landing gear, his co-pilot, Bert, noticed they had a problem. L-1011 jets, like 401, have three pieces of landing gear. They have wheels that come down under the left wing, they have wheels that come down under the right wing, and they have wheels that pop out of the nose of the plane. And each of these pieces of landing gear has a corresponding little light bulb, a green light bulb, inside the cockpit that once that piece of landing gear comes down and locks in place and is ready to be landed on, its green light will go on inside of the cockpit. But when Captain Bob lowered their landing gear, his co-pilot, Bert, noticed only two of the lights came on. The one that did not light up was the nose landing gear. Now, Captain okay. Bob and the other men in the cockpit, when they oh, saw so this issue... So it was up. So it was... Okay. Yeah. ...issue, <laughs> they immediately assumed it wow. had to be the light bulb itself that was faulty, not the actual nose landing gear, because this plane was brand new. It had been checked before they left, so the likelihood of the nose landing gear being faulty was incredibly slim. And so Captain Bob, while maintaining his approach towards Miami International, he retracted the landing gear, and then once it had come back into the plane, he just lowered it again, thinking this time all three lights would come on. Oh, oh, so, so he's landing to Miami, but this fucking wheel is stuck inside the plane. 
but oh, once yeah. again, once yeah. the landing gear was deployed the second time, still the nose landing gear light did not come on. And so frustrated, Captain Bob hopped on the radio and contacted Miami Air Traffic oh, Control shit. and told them that he could not confirm his landing gear was actually Come on, safe bro. What to the land on, fun, and so they would have to circle around for a bit in the sky and get it figured out. And so Miami Air Traffic Control acknowledged what Captain Bob said and then directed Captain Bob to fly out over the nearby Everglades, which is a massive wetlands area in Florida, and to stay out over the Everglades away from other traffic until they fixed the problem. And so once Flight 401 was out over the Everglades flying in a circular pattern, Captain Bob and his co-pilot set the plane to autopilot so that it would maintain a constant altitude of 2,000 feet and a constant speed of 200 miles per hour. And so once the plane was all set, Captain Bob and his co-pilot Bert began fiddling with this yeah. front nose gear indicator light Fuck that nose gear light bulb, boom. which they were convinced was faulty. And so they started by pressing on the light and when that didn't work they began twisting it and when that didn't work they actually pulled the light bulb off the panel you know what i did sometimes i used to do sometimes when my computer wasn't getting on i would kick the, I the shit out of it bro i would kick the fuck out of it until it starts until that i press that button and it starts and then i'm fucking kicking that shit because i was pressing the fucking button and nothing was happening yeah, and I didn't have the money to fix that. Also. Kind of blew the <laughs> so I was just kicking it, bro. And it worked. It has worked before, I'm telling you. But don't do it. Dirt and grime off of it, and then they jammed it back into the panel. But as soon as they did, not only did it not go back on, but they realized they had put it in sideways, and so they couldn't actually get it out again. And so now they're thinking, this light's not going to go on at all. Fuck. We need to find another way to make sure the nose landing gear has come down. And so Captain Bob, at this point, is totally frustrated. And so he turns around and he looks at Don Repo, the flight <laughs> engineer who's sitting right behind the co-pilot. And he tells Don to go down into the hellhole and directly inspect the front landing gear himself. So the hellhole is a space right below the cockpit, and the way you get to it is through a trap door in the okay. floor in the center of the cockpit. And then once down in the hellhole, there is this window that looks straight towards the front of the aircraft, oh, where shoot. you can look out and actually see the front landing gear, and you can make sure it was down. Oh, no way. And so Come Don on. Repo, he gets out of his seat, and he opens up the hellhole trap door, and he makes his way down below. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, 2,000 feet below Flight 401, a 43-year-old man named Robert Marquise, along with a friend of his, were looking for frogs in the Everglades, riding around on Robert's airboat. Okay. An airboat is a flat-bottom boat. Looking for frogs, what the fuck? The back of it that propels it forward. Awesome, this it's one. popular in the Everglades yeah. because the water depth is so shallow. At yeah, points yeah. in the Everglades, the water's only a couple of inches deep. All right, so we, all we around don't these two that. guys, okay, it is totally go. pitch black out. <laughs> there are no buildings or people for miles and miles and Jesus. miles. Their only light source is Robert's headlamp. Oh, fuck. And so at some point, Robert turns off the airboat. And, and they're going to say a fucking plane like standing in the middle of it, kind of standing around on each side. Heads. And it's all crazy. around them, they can hear the sound of alligators growling and snakes and frogs moving about the tall grass. Yeah. And as they're just kind of silently looking around them, out of the corner of Robert's eye, he sees something. And so he looks up right as he sees this huge orange and yellow flash that kind of came out of the ground roughly five miles away from where they were. And basically, as soon as Robert saw it, this flash dissipated and it was just totally gone. And so he turned to his friend who had not seen this flash and Robert said, hey, let's go investigate. Let's see what that was. Okay. And so Robert fired up his boat again and he began flying across the Everglades straight in the direction of where he saw Wait, it. Was that the real photo or no? Ah, not the real photo, right, right. This flash. And after 15 <laughs> minutes of cruising 40 miles per hour across imagine, the dark... Imagine catching it in a picture, like the explosion or whatever it was in the camera. But I've seen some some data bullshit in my life and if and if i had a camera to capture it bro in the right time bro you would be blown out of your mind arc expand they reached the area where and i wasn't high this flash had been and robert and his friend they just could not believe what they were looking at 
about 20 minutes earlier, back up inside of Flight 401, when Captain Bob turned around in his seat to tell the flight engineer, Don Repo, to go down into the hellhole, mm -hmm. it's believed that Captain Bob nudged the steering wheel with his leg. And this little nudge was enough to disengage the plane's autopilot, oh, which shoot. sent the plane into a gradual descent. But nobody noticed because one, it was totally pitch black outside. The Everglades below them, there's no lights, there's nothing. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. there was no moon that night. Fuck and so when me. they're looking out the window, there would have been no visual cues that they oh, were going fuck. down, up, or anything. It just would have looked like a total void outside. That's, that's scary as fuck. But he can look at the meter. He has the meter to, meet, to measure feet, right? The plane measures feet, right? Not feet human feet like feet no no and two God. the descent they were now suddenly in was so gradual it would not have felt like they were tumbling out of the sky it would have felt like they were just cruising as expected right and three all of the men in the cockpit were completely fixated on this light bulb problem. In fact, they were so fixated that when an alarm went off inside of the cockpit, telling them they had dipped below their intended altitude they of 2,000 feet, they were now going down, nobody noticed. Oh, Although, wow. to their credit, this alarm only sounded once and it wasn't that loud. And so not long after Don Repo had gone down into the hellhole, the plane crashed into the Everglades. No one on board Flight 401, from the cockpit crew to the passengers to the other flight staff, had any idea they were in an emergency until they hit the ground. Oh, and wow. when they hit the ground, the plane exploded, and that was what Robert Marquis saw when he looked up and saw that yellow and orange flash. Oh, and so Robert and his friend, they speed over to the crash site, and when they get there, they are the first ones there. And even though they're looking out and they can hear the sound of all these people screaming and crying what? and moaning, they can't see anything because the fire from this huge explosion was already out because the swampy wetlands had pretty much immediately extinguished it. And even though the plane had crashed into the ground at over 200 miles per hour, wow. it had not struck the ground at a very steep angle because basically the plane was in this gradual descent pattern and just kind of coasted until it hit the ground. But wait, how can you say, I'm too fucking slow, but how can you say that to his credit, the light, the noise wasn't beeping that loud. It was a small sound and and the, and it came out once. How, how do we know that though? How do we know such detail? Did they really die? You know what I mean? There's always this plot twist with Mr. Barrett and I don't know if I caught it. And so that, combined with the soft, muddy ground of the Everglades, meant that the impact of the plane hitting the ground was not nearly as violent as other plane crashes were. And that yeah. ultimately saved lives. In okay. fact, dozens of passengers survived the initial... Come on, man. I'm a fucking investigator. Don't fucking start with me. ...initial impact was the ground. <laughs> But many of them were left with these horrible injuries, or they were trapped within the wreckage, or both. When Robert and his friend arrived at the edge of the crash scene, Robert lifted up his headlamp and began to scan, and he saw all these body parts sticking out of the wreckage. Oh, that's a real photo, bro. Come on. The ground and headlamp and began to scan and he saw all these body parts sticking out of the ground oh, and then his light rested on the first body survivor parts. he saw and it was this man whose clothes had been completely burned off from the explosion all he had on was just a little bit of his socks on both ankles and this man was still strapped into the seat that he had been on on the Whoa. plane and when the plane had broken up his seat had fallen forward into the mud pinning this man's upper body and most of his face under several inches of water and so as Robert had oh, wow. scanned over with this light his light had hit this man's face and he had looked up and pleaded with Robert and his friend to come get him before he drowned and so Robert and his friend they jumped off their boat and ran over to the sky and pulled the chair up and out of the water oh, wow. saving this guy's life 
But as soon as he was up and out of the water, Robert and his friend began hearing more calls from other people in the darkness screaming for help. Robert and his friend would do their absolute best to save as many people as... Bro. Fuck my life. Come on, bro. Don't be such fucking scared. They possibly could, but there was just too many people who needed saving and not enough time. About 30 minutes after Robert and his friend had arrived at the scene, Man. the Coast Guard showed up in helicopters, and they, along with Robert and his friend, would spend the entire night pulling as many people to safety as they possibly could. By oh, the time the sun man. came up on the following day, Wait, that's a baby? Oh my, dude. My day, dude. there were no other survivors, Luke. Like, what the fuck? Damn. That's scary, man left to save. All told, 99 people perished and 77 survived. Amongst the dead were Captain Bob Loft and his co-pilot Bert Stocks. Look, look, look. The face, the fucking hippo, the hi fucking, you know what I'm saying? The hippo. Hippo. Yeah, the hippo. <laughs> so the face, the salmon, the hippo, and the and the Labrador. Yep. Still, and there. That's what we're looking at right now. Come on. Picture it, come on. I know you can see that, bro. Flight engineer Don Nebo, <laughs> who had gone down into the hellhole. Amongst these survivors Jesus. was Angelo Donadeo, the fourth man in the cockpit, as well as Jerry Ascal, the man who ironically had written that letter to Eastern Airlines saying how wonderful that flight had been. Oh, yeah, a major investigation yeah. following the crash would confirm that the Fabulous reason Flight 401 flight. went down was because of a number of factors, most notably human error. The investigation would also confirm that the nose landing gear was working perfectly fine. The light bulb mm. not coming on was a result of the light bulb being burned out. Okay. Following the investigation, Eastern Airlines would make every effort to compensate both the survivors of the crash and also families of those who were killed in the crash. Okay. Eastern Airlines would also make major changes to their training for their pilots and co-pilots and anybody that was ever going to be in the cockpit to ensure this type of disaster never happened again. But this was not the end of the story for Flight 401. What do you mean? Come on, what do you mean? What do you recent. mean? What do you mean? And when my friend you and and the mildly effective cold medicine made exclusive effective <laughs> mildly effective <laughs> before I could stop myself, I blurted out the truth. I want to create a mildly effective <laughs> mildly <laughs> effective <laughs> I just time seeing Mr. Ballen and laugh, bro. I don't fucking know. Let's go. That's cool. <laughs> For almost three years after the crash, yeah. hundreds of Eastern Airline employees began Beard to experience man. a terrifying <laughs> phenomenon. Now, at first, what? for almost three years after the crash, hundreds of Eastern Airline employees began to experience a terrifying phenomenon. Right. Now, at first, many of these employees were going to their superiors and reporting what happened to them. But very early on, Eastern Airlines made it clear that they didn't want anybody to talk about this. Anytime an employee made one of these reports about this phenomenon, they were either sent to the psychiatrist or they were just fired. However, despite okay. this intense pressure from Eastern Airlines to their employees oh, to be Come quiet on, about what was going on inside of their ranks, there were still some very brave employees who had firsthand experience with this terrifying phenomenon what who is this still phenomenon? came forward and told their stories to the press and to journalists. They just did it anonymously. And of course they did. Of course they did. Because now you tell it. So they're going... Fuck me. <laughs> what the fuck? We know that they told because you are telling. Come and so on. I'm going to tell you two <laughs> of the most chilling accounts from those employees. Keep in right. mind the names used in these stories have all been changed. All right. What is this kind of music, bro? Shut up. Fuck up. 
In March of 1973, so three months after Flight 401 had crashed in the Everglades, an Eastern Airlines flight attendant named Ginny was assigned to a flight from New York to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Working with her on this flight was her very close friend and fellow flight attendant, a woman named Denise. Mm. Neither of these two women were on Flight 401 when it right. crashed. The plane these two women would be working on on their flight to Florida was called number 318 by Eastern Airlines, and it was an L-1011 just like Flight 401 had been. Okay. In fact, plane number 318 actually had some original parts from Flight 401 on it. Because it oh, would what? turn out, after that huge investigation was uh, done on the crash, the investigators discovered lots of parts from Flight 401 were still in pretty good shape. And so after rigorously testing them and ensuring they did really work, those on. parts were actually installed on other L-1011 jets in the Eastern Airline fleet. You fucking cheap ass motherfuckers. <laughs> Of course they would take, of course, now, for the of course they would take an old ruined piece of equipment, what the fuck, to build another plane, yeah. Record, this that was not fun. considered an inappropriate thing to do. These parts were extremely really? expensive and they worked perfectly fine and they were not involved in causing Flight 401 to crash. Oh, come on, how do you know that? And so no one batted an eye when Eastern Airlines put these parts on their other planes. So mm. Ginny and Denise, along with several other Eastern Airlines flight attendants, board plane number 318, and after takeoff, the flight attendants began going through the very long and drawn out process of getting food and drink for the nearly 200 people on board the flight. And so the way the flight attendants divvied up the work is they would have some of the attendants on the main level of the plane in the cabin taking orders from all the passengers. Wait, I gotta, I gotta open this. I gotta open the window, dude. Fuck me. All right. That's what I'm talking about. And then the other flight attendants would be down on the lower level, the second level of the plane where the kitchen was, preparing all the food and drinks. And so at some point during this process, Denise, who was up on the main level helping with taking orders, realized she didn't have anything to do. She had taken all the okay. orders she could, and so she decided she would head down to the second level, to the kitchen, where her good friend Ginny was, right. to see if she could help her. But ironically, as Denise got in the elevator in the back of the plane and began heading down to the second level, Ginny, who was on the second level, discovered she did not have anything to do. She'd already prepped her cart. And so she had gotten into the other elevator and began going up to the main level to mm. see if Denise needed any help. And so the two women literally passed each other in their elevators, <sighs> but didn't see each other. And so once Ginny arrived at the main level, the cabin level, she got off the elevator and she walked down the aisle and she began asking around to the other attendants if they knew where Denise was. And they would tell her, oh, you know, she just left a minute ago to go down to see you. And so after a couple of minutes, Ginny would leave the main level and go back down the elevator to the lower level to find Denise. Okay. Now, to understand what happens next, you need to have a basic understanding of the layout of the second level. So Tell when you come down on either of those two elevators, yeah, when the doors open, right you'll now. be looking down a stretch of hallway, basically the length of the plane from the back towards the front. Fuck, and when you step scary, off the elevator, you'd be stepping into the middle of the kitchen. Now the kitchen looking out from the elevator it was very very cramped and on the left side was a row of ovens that were all stacked up against each other and then on the other side on the right side was a row of cabinets and cupboards if you were to walk down the kitchen straight towards the front of the plane you would eventually reach a wall that separated the kitchen to the lounge area and there was right. a door slightly off to the right side on this wall that you could walk through to get into the lounge so if you were standing in the kitchen and looking Looking in the direction of this door, you wouldn't really be able to see into the lounge area because, again, the door was kind of off to the side. 
you would have to actually go over to the door and poke your head through to get a full unobstructed view of the lounge. And all right. the lounge was was a couple of sofas and chairs kind of arranged in a circle. So Ginny has gotten back in the elevator and she's made her way back downstairs to continue looking for Denise. She gets down to the lower level, the doors open up and she looks out into the kitchen and Denise is not there. In fact, the kitchen is totally empty and the, the door leading into the lounge area is shut. So she can't even see in part of the way into the lounge to see if anybody is in there. But the second Ginny stepped off the elevator into the kitchen, she immediately had this powerful sense that Denise was definitely down there somewhere on the second level with her, probably in the lounge area that she couldn't see. And because Ginny felt so confident that Denise was down there, she actually didn't start by calling out for Denise or what? walking to the door, opening it up and looking into the lounge to make sure Denise was there. Instead, Ginny just turned to the left and went to the ovens and began preparing food for the attendants upstairs. And as she's making these plates of food, Ginny would periodically look over at the closed door leading into the lounge, kind of expecting it to open up at any point and see Denise walk out. <coughs> but after a couple of minutes, no one had opened the door from the lounge. And Ginny was thinking to herself, you know, I'm making quite a bit of noise over here. If anybody was down here, wouldn't they come out of the lounge and just see who it was? And because Ginny, again, had this really intense feeling that she was not alone down there, she began to think, wait a minute, is Denise playing a practical joke on me? Is she hiding in the lounge? Or is she hiding in one of the cabinets on the right side here and she's going to jump out and grab me? And so the second Ginny so began why? thinking about that, she became really paranoid. And so as she's making this food, she's pretty much constantly looking over at the door or kind of scanning behind her, waiting for Denise to launch out and scare her. But again, after several more minutes, Ginny didn't see anybody come out of the lounge and none of the cabinet doors opened <coughs> up. Tell, it was just her down there. However, the longer she stayed down there, the stronger that feeling got that someone was in the room with her. And so now she can't even make her food. She's completely turned. Whoa, what the fuck? What the fuck? Man, I'm so high for this. Literally, I, I heard the... Oh my God. Fuck, man. <coughs> Why do I see scary shit? Why? What? <laughs> but I'm really interested now. I can't, I can't let it go. Got that someone was in the room with her. And so now she can't even make her food. She's completely turned around, just scanning all around the kitchen. Really at this point, hoping Denise jumps out to scare her. And when Denise didn't do that, she Why don't you go tell what the fuck? And he just began walking <coughs> over to the door that would lead into the lounge. And so when she reached the door, her heart was racing like mad. She reached down to the handle. She turned it. She... Oh, she could open it. What the fuck? Pushed it open and she poked her head in real quick and there was no one in the lounge. But Wait. immediately, the second her head was in that room, that feeling that someone was down there with her spiked and she got chills all over her body. And she what? ran into the back of the lounge and looked behind all of the chairs and sofas, praying at this point that Denise was gonna be down there. But after look- Man, I'm fucking paranoid. Come on now. Fuck me. Mr. Bell and his videos. Looking fuck that. all over the back of the lounge, there was no one there. And so finally, Ginny turns around and she's totally racked with fear because now she's on the very far end of the lounge. There's no one in the lounge. She knows there's no one in the kitchen. And here she is still getting that sensation that she was not alone down there. Oh, yeah. But she has to go all the way back across the lounge, through that door, into the kitchen to get back to the elevator so she can escape. And so Ginny almost instinctively moved immediately to the left side of the lounge and put her back up against the wall to make sure no one could be behind her. And then she began really what the fuck slowly inching her way along the left wall towards the door that was now open that would lead back into the kitchen and as she's slowly shimmying along her view of the kitchen is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and the whole right. time she's thinking i'm gonna see someone in the kitchen because this sensation that someone is down here with me is not going away but when she finally gets to the door and crosses into the kitchen, Nothing there's happens. still no one there. And so she makes a run at that point to the elevator. Fuck she me, starts bro. hitting the button. And as she's hitting the button, she's turning around and she has that awful feeling that someone's right behind her. And then finally the car comes down. She hops inside the elevator. She shuts the doors. She hits the button. 
What the fuck? Why is this so scary, man? Come on now. Ghost of Light 401. I thought this wasn't, wasn't gonna be about ghosts, actually. I don't fucking know. I don't know. I, I didn't know it was going to be for ghost ghosts. I thought it was a clickbait or something. The fuck? Button, and she begins going back up. Hell when no. the elevator cart got back to the main level and the doors opened again, Ginny almost knocked over the flight attendant that was standing right outside of it, right. a woman named Mildred. And after Mildred and Ginny kind of regained their balance, they both looked at each other, and Mildred could see very clearly that Ginny looked horrible. She was totally right. pale, she was sweating. And so Mildred said, Ginny, are you okay? What's going on? And Ginny would just say, I, 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 I don't know. I, I can't tell you what's going on. I, I don't know. But Mildred, instead of asking follow-up questions, just said, Ginny, you need to come with me. And so Ginny would follow Mildred, who led them back around behind the elevators to the space in the back of the plane, kind of out of view of the passengers. And there, Ginny would find Denise. And Denise looked pale as a ghost. She was sweating and looked totally shaken up. It would turn out when Ginny left the lower level for the first time to come me, up to the main level to look for Denise and then learned that Denise was not up there, that Denise had actually gone down to look for Ginny. In those few minutes that Ginny was up on the main level before she went back down again to continue looking for Denise, Denise was on the lower level. And Denise would say when she got off the elevator into the kitchen, there was no one down there, but immediately she believed Ginny had to be down there because of the strong sense that she was not alone down there. Wait, what? However, when she opened up the door to look into the lounge, she didn't see anyone and it totally spooked her. She shut the door. She ran back to the... Oh, it was the same thing that Jenny did. So they both, they both, they both did the same, the same thing, like a simulator. You elevators, know? and she went back upstairs. Jeez. And as she was going up in her elevator Crazy. car, who once again passed her in the other elevator car, Jenny. And so once again, the two women did not see each other. And so these two women, who had never experienced anything like this before in their lives, had nearly identical experiences, totally independent of each other, just a couple of minutes apart, in the exact same space. It was just too many coincidences oh, yeah. for them yep. to totally write it off. And also, the, this wasn't a simulation, they just, they just did this, but I don't get that, bro. How can you be so... How can it be so fucking timed? She gets down, she gets up. She gets up, she gets down. I don't know. And so that was a big yeah, reason fuck. why they felt like they had to come forward with their information. One month later, plane number 318, the same plane that Ginny and Denise had had their frightening experiences on, was at Newark Liberty International Airport in New Jersey, undergoing pre-flight checks from its crew before its flight to Miami that morning. After most of the checks were done, the passengers were allowed to board the plane, and then after it seemed like most of the passengers had arrived and taken their seats, the senior flight attendant, whose name was Sis, began counting oh, the people sis. on board the plane <laughs> the to make fuck. sure they had everyone. And after counting up and down the rows, she realized their head count was off by one. They had one too many people. And so when Sis began recounting, she actually quickly identified the discrepancy. Sis was standing in first class in the aisle, and as she was counting down the left side of first class passengers, she noticed there was an Eastern Airlines captain seated in one of the seats. And so immediately Sis thought, oh, okay, I don't recognize this person, but since he's in uniform, he must yeah. be deadheading. Deadheading is a fairly Dead common heading, practice for airline employees oh, yeah. where if they need to be yeah, on a particular a flight a but are not physically at the origin airport, they will just hop on another company flight that happens to be going to the airport they need to go to. And at least in the 1970s, it was not uncommon for employees not necessarily to tell the flight staff until they were literally on the plane because these employees would just check the manifest, see if there were openings, yeah. And then climb on board. And so Sis that assumed that was exactly what this God man damn. had done. And that was why he was unaccounted for. Nah, and it ghost. was why they had this extra person. And so she just needed to get Shit. his name to account for him. And so Sis turned and took a couple of steps until she was right in front of this guy who was still just seated looking straight ahead. And Sis introduced herself and asked him if he was deadheading. 
But the captain just continued to stare straight ahead and didn't even seem to register that Sis was talking to him, despite the fact that Sis was right on top of him and speaking very, very clearly and nobody else was talking. And so Sis, who was aware of the fact that this guy clearly should have heard her, just kind of waited for a second and then just asked again, you know, hey, what's your name? I need to make sure that you are in fact deadheading. But again, this captain just sat there without moving and didn't remotely react to Sis. Now, by this point, another flight attendant named Diane had looked over and actually saw Sis having this strange interaction with this Eastern Airlines captain. Uh -huh. And so Diane walked over and listened as Sis, for a third time, tried to get this guy's attention, but he still Shit. did nothing. And so Diane and Sis, they start looking at each other like, what do we do about this? And at some point, Sis just says, okay, I'm gonna go tell the captain, you know, he can deal with this. And so Diane stayed in the aisle next to this silent seated captain while Sis turned and walked towards the cockpit and she told the captain, whose name yeah. was George. Come on, come on, let's so go, George, let's go. he leaves the cockpit with Sis Sorry, by his George. side and they start walking down the aisle back towards where this guy was and where Diane was. And by the time they get there, no six there. other passengers kind of in the general vicinity had noticed something strange was going on. And so they were all kind of turned around in their seats looking at this captain captain who was sitting there and Diane oh, and Sis oh, and George what? kind of waiting to see what was going to happen. Yeah. And so George and Sis, they walk right up alongside Diane and this seated silent captain and George immediately crouched down to get a good look at this guy's face because okay. again, this captain had just looked So they're, they're all seeing him. Nah, straight ahead with a fuck? hat on and so no one had really looked at him yet and so George kneels down and he sees this guy's face for the first time and he falls over and goes oh my god that's Bob Loft the same Bob Loft who had died on flight 401 the captain of flight 401 George had known Bob really well and knew exactly what Bob looked like but before Bob, Sis, Diane, or the six other passengers that were all watching could do anything, the seated silent captain that looked exactly like Bob Loft vanished into thin air right in front of all of them. And immediately, Wait, <laughs> the six passengers on board the flight that saw this happen became hysterical. They could not understand what they had just seen. People are screaming and crying. And George, Diane, and Sis, they were very shaken at what they saw, but they knew they were in charge of the... Man, sh shut the fuck up, bro. God damn it, man. Flight. So they tried to calm down the passengers, but then very quickly, they organized a search of the plane because they're telling themselves, no one can just disappear into thin air. This guy has to be somewhere on the plane. And so for over an hour, the passengers were told to stay in their seats and were told to stay calm while the flight crew searched every crevice, every... Why would you say it? He vanished, bro. He disappeared and in the What the of fuck? This flight to see if they could find, to find ghost, this guy, bro? but they never did. This and so after, a, after a, ghost, a very bro, long man. delay, plane number 318, along with its very shaken up passengers and flight crew, eventually rumbled out onto the runway and took off. When they landed in Miami, the first thing Jeez. George, Diane, and Sis all did is they went in and filed a report about what they had seen, about this vanishing person. But Eastern Airline didn't do anything about their reports. In fact, the logbook where these reports were kept was conspicuously missing a couple of weeks later when some other employees of the airline heard about this vanishing person and wanted to read the reports themselves. Okay. And when these employees went to their superiors and asked if they could get this logbook, the answer from the top was George, Diane, and Sis never filed those reports. There was no vanishing person. This whole thing is a bunch of crap. But George, Diane, and Sis all said, we filed those reports. And apparently some other pilots within Eastern Airlines had actually seen the reports before the logbook went missing. And they would tell other people that what they read was terrifying. Over the next two years, there would be an astounding number of other totally unexplainable events that took place on other planes within Eastern Airlines fleet. However, the strange events only occurred on L-1011 jets that had parts on them from the crashed Flight 401. Man. Some of these unexplained events included more sightings of the silent seated captain who looked just like Bob Loft. And in fact, one of those sightings was Why 
Dubai, why, an why, Eastern why, why would you build a, who after, an airplane from the beginning? Well, like, why would you build an airplane from other planes? Like, what the fuck? From destroyed planes? Are you kidding me, bro? That's fucking logic right there. If people back then would have logic, this wouldn't have happened, bro. So seeing this captain what? vanish into thin air right in front of him, the executive freaked out and ran off the plane and demanded the plane be searched top to bottom. But like the last search, nothing was found. Wait, what, what, what did he say? Right in front of him, the executive, who after seeing this captain vanish into thin air right in front of him, the executive freaked out and ran off the plane and demanded the plane be searched top to bottom. But like the last search, nothing was found. Oh, on another shit, occasion, right. the on. catering company that the loaded fuck? food directly into the second level of these L-1011s, basically right into the kitchen, one of their staff spotted a man wandering around the lower level that looked just like Don Repo, the flight engineer from the doomed Flight 401. And mm. when the staff member spoke to this man who looked like Don Repo, Don Repo turned towards him and then vanished into thin air. The catering company was so scared when this happened that they refused to go back into the plane and it caused a massive delay. On another flight, on board plane number 318, the pilot and co-pilot began hearing banging coming from the hellhole. And when the pilot got up and opened up the hellhole and went down below and shined his light, he didn't see anything. But when he went to climb back up into the cockpit, he looked up and standing in the cockpit was once again, Don Repo looking straight down at him. Right, man, I can't do this anymore, bro. <laughs> I must, oh my God. I must say, bro, I'm in this right here because this is getting too much. <laughs> like what? Come on. This is getting too out of hand, bro. Out of hand. Out of hand. I can't. I can't. While I'm high, I can't. Uh, I really can't, bro. I can't do it. I can't. I can't watch scary videos. Like, comment down below. Below. <laughs> comment down below. What do you want to see? while high like put something funny bro don't put something scary bro because i'm gonna lie i'm not gonna last the video and, and you know what it's gonna be a shit video anyway so don't don't comment scary video comment like our fucking no action videos all right or high videos you know what i'm saying watching high videos while high you know what i'm saying like like some deep shit I don't want ghosts and scary videos, right? <laughs> so, if you like, well, well, bro, I didn't comment it much on this video, I know. But come on, bro. You can give me a sub. Come on, bro. Just one sub. Like, like one. Come on. It takes only what? Boom. Three minutes. Uh, three, three seconds. <laughs> three minutes. Three seconds, bro. Three seconds. And you got change my mood of the day. What about that? What the fuck? My, you got some superpowers, bro. I tell you. But you, you're not using them. <laughs> you're not using... You're not using your full poten potential, bro. Your full potential as a human being. Like, in three seconds, you can make me... <coughs> a good day, you know what I'm saying? <coughs> And there you are, stand, standing here, just rewinding the video, like it's, I'm going to continue the actual video, Mr. Barn. <laughs> You're out of your mind. You really can't comprehend the power that you got, bro. Just in three seconds. Damn. But you're a loser, bro. <laughs> no, I'm coughing. I'm coughing up. I'm coughing. Come on. Yeah, I will see you in the next one. Love you so much.